Uh, the last couple of years have been great. And just when you think it can't get any better, it gets better. And it used to be that you could go out on just about any trip out of San Diego up to about maybe a four day trip. And you would, if you had two rods, it was enough. If you picked the right two for that particular trip, you were going to be fine. And the fishing has just gotten better and better, more species available, bigger individuals of the species we already had. Fishing rods are like golf clubs. There's just really no such thing as one that does everything. It just, it just can't happen. Uh, fishing rods, each one does a fairly specific job. There will be a little bit, little bit of bleed over on one side, a little bit of bleed over on the other side. But they really do what they do. And it doesn't matter how good of a driver you have when you need a putter. So I've kind of distilled it down to the five combos, rod and reel combos, that you don't leave the dock without them. Because I've actually tested it a couple of times, and I've not brought one of them. And sure enough, that would be the one that I wish that I had. And so you're covering a wide variety of species, a wide variety of, uh, of fish sizes. And I know what you guys out there are like, all you searcher anglers. So I'm going to start on the low end, the lightest stuff. We're going to talk about that. And we're going to work our way up towards the heavier, the bigger bluefin tuna, the bigger yellowfin tuna gear. And um, I'm sure that, that Callie and Celia will be reading me the questions. But I know that if I started out with the heavy stuff, I'd never get to the light stuff. So, and then also, and you guys have to be nice, Callie and Celia are going to be deciding who wins. I've got the nice Fathom. Uh, 40 star drag reel. It's a single speed reel. Sorry, that's what I had. But uh, one of you out there in searcher land is going to win that, and I don't pick. I may, get, I may end up drawing the number, but I'm, I'm not going to be the one that decides it. Anyway, we're going to go through those five rod and reel combos that you do not leave the dock without because it's a big ocean out there, and you do not know what's going to be happening till you get there. So, and... Uh, Obviously, post your questions up on the feed, and we'll do our best to answer them. So we're going to start out with a lightest one, and that's what I call the 20, 25-pound rig, a.k.a. the finesse live bait rig. And that's normally going to be a star drag reel. You don't need a two-speed reel in this line category. This one happens to be the Penn Fathom number 15 star drag. The way I like to set the line, the line system up is it's filled up about – three quarters of the way with braid. And then the top shot is going to be 25 to 50 yards. I know I've seen some of Art's videos that, that, uh, that he's done recently. And uh, Art, you, you tend to like about a, about a hundred foot top shot. Yeah. So that I guess is 33 and a third yards, but exactly. So somewhere between 25 and 50 yards after you fish for a while, you're going to come up with, with your own particular uh, preference on that. But that's kind of the way I like to set it up. And lots of times, it happened several times last summer, and, and I mean for a couple of week period and the, and, the, and the summers before, the fish just get finicky. They're not that interested in biting. Maybe the bait is not particularly big. And you have to present that, that live sardine on 20-pound test. Now, you're not going to catch a 100-pound tuna on 20-pound on test. We realize that. But a lot of times, it's 20, 25, 30, 40 pound tuna, and they won't bite anything heavier than 20 pound test. You better make sure that you've got a reel with a good drag that is properly adjusted. Check with the crew to make sure that you've got your drag set properly. Another thing that when you're fishing that, that, that finesse type rig, you're going to be using a relatively small hook. And that is, I don't know if that'll even show up on camera. I guess you guys at home can, can decide if you can see that. That's an owner gorilla light in a size two. If you can't see the hook, neither can the fish. That's kind of the point. So this is this is the type of rig that you're going to use when you just want to get a bite. If the fish are over 50 pounds, Art will remind you, don't throw this out there. But when they're 25, 30 pounds and they're just being fish, fish don't really need a reason not to bite. They have their own reasons. This is a rig that you're going to use a lot. And um, as far as the rod goes, 
Uh, I like eight foot rods. Some people like seven. Occasionally there's people that like nine. You want to make sure that you have a rod that you can also cast the bait out a little ways away from the boat. Uh, I like to get an eight foot rod that's rated and really any rod that you use, you want to use as close to the middle of the line rating as you possibly can get. So if you're going to use 20 or 25 pound test line, you want to get a rod that's rated something like 12 to 30 pound, something like that. And uh, that will give you the best combination of, of power and finesse. You also don't, when you when you're using a small hook like that, if you use a rod tip that's too that's too heavy, you're going to rip that hook right out of that fish's mouth. So that is uh, again my my uh, my favorite finesse rig. Uh, I did catch a couple of bluefin last year on this, um, over forty pounds. It, it's not going to happen quickly, Art. As, as Art, I'm sure can attest. He's watched people probably battle them for an hour. Um, and as long as there's fish around the boat, uh, Art's not going to be too upset about it. But again, when, when there are bigger fish are around, that's not what this is for. But for some reason, the last couple of years, from maybe the last week of August to the last week of September, this has just been the type of rig that you want to make sure that you have. And sure enough, I can remember at least one trip that I went on, not this, not last year, but two years ago. I, I didn't bring these because I, I was going to catch nothing but 100-pound tuna. Wrong. Uh, you know, they were, they were 35 pounds, and they were not biting one thing heavier than 25-pound tests. And really, 20 was better. So, again, what about fluorocarbon, Steve? Oh, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, I don't, again, I don't know if this is going to show up or not because it's pretty small. But right about there, you'll see I've got a little knot there. That's where I've attached. I usually go with about four feet of fluorocarbon. And Art has definitely uh, uh, reminded me enough times that I don't forget anymore. You want to make sure that you make your fluorocarbon length uh, short enough or long enough so that when you're, when you're casting your bait, that the, that the knot is not in the tip of the rod. And so that's going to vary a little bit based on your style of casting and how long the rod is. For me, it's about four <coughs> feet. For me, it's about four feet. Um, for some of you, especially if you use a shorter rod, a seven-foot rod, you might only do that with three feet. But you do not want that knot tip to go in, inside the rod tip when you're casting. That's a really – I'm glad you brought that up because I – that knot is so small, I actually didn't notice it. So I'm glad that you brought that up. That that's a, was an important point that I wanted to bring up. And that applies to pretty much any time you're fishing with live bait. I like to have the, the, the length of fluorocarbon, the maximum length that I can still cast comfortably with the knot outside the rod tip. Uh, with a nine-foot rod, a lot of times that's five feet. But, uh, again, you, you at home will, will have to work that out on your own as far as what the the, uh, the ideal length is. We've been asked what kind of knot you use. Oh, that, that's a good one. Well, on the, knot, on, on the knot to the hook, I pretty much always use a single San Diego. And you'll love this one, Art. I learned the single San Diego, I think, in 1973. On the searcher, Kenny taught it to me. How about that? So there's, there's, a, little, there's a little history. Yeah. And then the, the, this is the, the other knot that's a really a really common question, which is your, your monofilament to your fluorocarbon. I like to use the surgeon's knot. Oh, and by the way, Art's done some really, really good videos previously with knots. So you can look those up on the, on the searcher channel or you can check on YouTube. But I like to use a surgeon's knot with four turns. Uh, if you look in the knot books, a lot of times they'll show you the surgeon's knot with two or maybe only three turns, um, and that's fine for smaller fish. When you're when you're trying to figure out how to catch a 40-pound bluefin tuna on 20-pound test line, go with the four turns. And uh, as as with all knots, lots and lots of spit is going to make sure that that knot seats down tightly. If you if your knot did not seat down tightly, cut it and retie. If those of you that have been out on my trips, on my Penn Fishing University trips, on the uh, on the searcher, uh, you've seen me lots of times tying a knot, tying on a hook, tying on a lure, looking at it and going, nope, don't like that, and cutting it off. You cannot, cannot let uh, a subpar knot go out in the water because sure enough, the biggest fish of the trip, maybe the biggest fish of your life, that's when it's going to bite. 
on and 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 speaking of fishing university um those of you that 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 want to uh, uh, converse with me more, please go. Let's see if I can show this to the camera on Facebook, Pan Fishing University. Please give it a like and a follow. I try to keep my personal Facebook page to my anybody that could have attended my high school reunion. So my fishing friends, please go to Pan Fishing University. Give it a like. Give it a follow, and you can ask me questions there. So that's combo number one. And I'm sure you guys will have some questions about that, but we're gonna put that aside for a moment. We have a question. Do you prefer underhand casting with bait or overhand? Do I prefer, for myself, I prefer underhand casting. Um, it takes a little bit more timing. Uh, you have to be a little bit more careful in doing it, but as long as you can get the, the, the bait, and, and you don't have to set a world record casting distance. Mm -hmm. With a live bait it's far more important that you let that bait land gently on the water and swim away on its own to uh to get the distance from the boat but um for some people you know just to get any sort of distance they need to cast overhand that's okay too but personally i prefer underhand yes for 15 to 20 pound test fishing is it better to keep your braid as light as possible, like 30 pound test, to create less drag for a sardine swimming through the water? Or does fishing 50 pound braid on a setup like that have no difference? Uh, I, I guess that would be A, yes, I like the lighter braid. Uh, generally, I don't like to have light tests together. So if I've got 20 pound test top shot, I don't like to have 20 pound braid. I like to have the braid be whatever whatever line class I'm using. I like to have the braid be for sort of one bump above whatever the top shot is. So yes, I do like I do like the lighter braid. I think that answers the question. Okay. Okay. Down the road, maybe answer about uh, talk about left-handed reel, uh, left-handed fathoms that might be a no. <laughs> okay, left-handed fathoms. Um, please check the pen fishing uh, uh, website, and they'll have, they'll have specs on all the different uh, models that are left-handed. Uh, in the star drag models in the Fathom with no level line, there are no lefties. I'll tell you ahead of time. Uh, with the two-speed versions, which we're about to discuss, there are some lefties, and I will mention exactly which ones they are. For the, well, we used to think it was only seven or 8% of people were, were left-handed, but apparently uh, it's more like 13, 14% of the people are left-handed. So it's becoming more relevant. Uh, one of our very good friends, Captain Buzz Brizendy, who's left-handed, every time somebody asks him about left-handed reels, he says, just learn to fish with a right-handed reel. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not left-handed. Uh, I will help you where I can. I have a standing joke with a longtime customer that has left-handed reels, and he comes on the boat, and when he's on the day one when he starts to fish, I say, Mr. Guy, your your reel's on backwards, <laughs> and so that that uh, that starts the trip off. Uh, it's kind of tradition. It's an inside joke with he and I, but that's uh, something you know with left-handed reels is that sometimes people make that error. They put their right-handed reel on backwards, and then it's it's uh, it can it's be on the left-hand side, and it's backwards. So anyway, that's just been, uh, you know, for over 30 years, um, Hal Guy has been coming on the searcher and he has left-handed I, I can't say that I've never made that mistake myself. <laughs> so, okay, so now this is, now we're getting, now things are getting fun. Now the two are getting bigger, so to speak. And this is still a finesse outfit. This is, and this is a really crucial one, especially the last couple of years, uh, quite often in the late summer, uh, you know, there are lots and lots of boats going out. The bait boats are working really, really hard to keep the bait supply up. And sometimes the bait is just not that good. Either it's not very lively or it's not very big. And all of a sudden the fish are getting bigger. They're not 25, 30 pounds. They're 50, they're 60, they're 70 pounds, but they're still very, very finicky. And they just won't. You wish they would bite on your 60 pound test, but they won't bite. You know, you wish they would, but they won't. This is your 30 pound rig. And uh, an answer, sort of going backward, an answer to that question this is I prefer the pen 
Fathom two speed, the regular number 15. It's a little bit lighter. It's got a lighter spool so that when I'm trying to get that small bait out there, uh, it, it, uh, it will do that a little bit more, more easily, but it does come in the extra narrow version. I don't know if I can show that to the camera or not. The 15 extra narrow. So it's a little taller and a little narrower. And that does come in a left-handed version in a two-speed. So maybe you're just a right-handed person that prefers to crank left-handed. And um, also something that, that Art will like to, to hear because it's got a bigger side plate, the 15 Extra Narrow has bigger gears and a bigger drag surface, even though the line capacity is identical between these two reels. I like this one, I like the, the smaller one because the spool's a little bit lighter. And all you 25 year old professional athletes out there, of which I am definitely not one, I can, I can, hear, you through, I can hear you through the internet saying, you don't need 30 pound, a two-speed reel for 30-pound test. That's crazy wrong. Because even if you're a 25-year-old professional athlete, even if you're taking steroids, okay, when you hook that 50 or 60 or 70-pound bluefin tuna on 30-pound test, what do you have to do? You have to lift up. You have to wind down. You have to the time you lift up on that, on that tuna, Okay, you lift him up, here he comes. Then when you wind down, he gets to point his nose down. He swims down a little bit. Now, you've literally doubled the amount of time that you have to fight that fish. With a two-speed reel, or as, as, I can't remember what store it is, it says, push the easy button. You push the easy button, it's like that. Now you're in low, and literally, once that tune is done running, you just wind. You just wind slowly. You just wind. You're not lifting up. You're not pumping down. You're just winding. So that instead of tuning his nose going up and then going down and he swims a little bit and he does that over and over and over, he keep, you get his nose, nose pointed up and he just literally, as he's circling, he's corkscrewing himself right to the surface. Now, that's why you want to have a two-speed reel in 30-pound test. Now, those of you that are old enough to remember albacore, when we used to use a lot of 30 pound tests for live bait for albacore, obviously you don't need a two speed reel for them. You know, a 30, 35 pound is a pretty big one and you wouldn't need it. But these days, both the yellow fin and the blue fin, you can be out there and um, it's very, very tough to get a bite. And speaking of which, I was gonna show you guys this and pull this back, there's that, there's that knot with the fluorocarbon again at about four feet, four turn surgeon's knot. I will be amazed if this shows up on camera. You sort of have to take my word for it. There's a, there's a four turn surgeon's knot there. And then on the end, now this, once you get to this class, now I'm up into circle hooks. And that is a number four owner Mutu circle hook. Because when you're hooking that, 50, 60 pound bluefin or yellowfin tuna, uh, that bite's gonna take a while. And once tuna get over about 50 pounds, they don't have teeth like a shark or a wahoo, but they have teeth. And they will chew through your line if you, you know, if you're in a, in a half hour or longer fight, they're gonna chew through your line. So what the servo hook does is it co comes right to the corner of their mouth. And that way, again, you, you can hold on to them, they don't bite through your line through the period of the fight. So with this rig, that number four owner Mutu hook has just proven to be, and, and, and Art, Art hates it when I tell people stuff like this, but I've caught tuna up to 95 pounds on this exact rig with that hook. Now, not that I recommend it, but uh, I think you're gonna have a lot of uh, those, those, uh, those late summer bites where the 50, 60 pounders are only biting a light line, this is gonna be the rig you want. Also, if you're on a little bit longer trip, uh, I love this rig, I, I don't have it rigged up this way, with about a two foot wire leader, light wire leader, and I use this for uh, live bait fishing for Wahoo. So this, this will do a lot, a lot of stuff for you. We have some questions. Do ringed hooks versus non-ringed hooks matter? Uh, if you would have asked me that two years ago, I would have said absolutely ringed hooks are better. 
Um, I still generally like ringed hooks, I, uh, but I would rather have the exact style and the exact model of hook, whatever it is I want for that style of fishing. Um, and this particular hook doesn't come in a ringed version in this size yet. Um, however, in the la especially last year, a little bit the year before, and especially in 2020, 2020 was just the non-standard year for everything. Uh, yeah, don't, I, I don't want to get the world started on, on the year 2020, but um, even there were a couple of times when even that extra amount of metal that a, that a ring added, and it wasn't a lot of extra metal, but it was enough extra metal that in some cases it spooked the fish a little bit. So in this particular ring, like I said, I love this hook. So, and it doesn't come in a ring version, and I've done extremely, extremely well because it's a small hook. Uh, when you, uh, we'll, use, we'll use Mickey the Mackerel here. He's a popular guy. Uh, generally with this, I'm gonna be doing what the, what's called shoulder hooking, which is kind of up there on the, if a fish had a neck, it would be in the nape of the neck. And uh, this hook will just kind of get lost next to a sardine. And the, 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 even a finicky tuna doesn't see it very well. So I guess I, I guess I, I was kind of a wishy-washy answer on whether or not I like ringed hooks. And I guess I'll say I sometimes like ringed hooks. Well, was that, was that wishy-washy enough? No, it was perfect. Okay. How do, you, how do you prefer, nose hook, shoulder hook, or butt hook? Oh, well, whatever I prefer is irrelevant. What did the fish prefer? <laughs> and the fish had the final vote, and the fish changed their vote, not only day to day, but sometimes hour to hour. Um, generally, and this is just, is just how you start. If you're fishing bluefin and they're kind of they're kind of way away from the boat, breaking, but they're but they're boiling, you know, 100, 150, 200 yards away from the boat or more, and you got to get your bait out there, then what they call shoulder hooking, that's again right there in the nape of the neck. If a fish had a neck, I like to use that because now what that that bait is aimed away from the boat. The hook the hook kind of folds down like that, and that that bait, even if he's not too big, he can really pull. He can really pull and get your bait get, get the maximum distance from the boat. Also, and why fish do this, I cannot begin to explain. Why ask why they just do? Sometimes after you've let your bait swim 150 yards away from the boat. You, you then decide you're going to wind him in. So you wind him in slowly. You're literally, now he comes back at the boat, and he's like this, and you're slow trolling him back to the boat. And sometimes uh, the tuna, that, that's how they want it. I don't know why, they just do. So that's one, one way that I like to use it. Anytime you're using a sinker, and uh, I didn't, I didn't, and we're going to talk more about sinker rigs later, but anytime I'm using a sinker, um, then you've got to do either one of these two styles, which is sideways across the bridge of the nose or up through the nose. Any sort of sinker, whether it's a small sinker or a big sinker or a slip sinker, Art loves slip sinkers. Um, that's going to be the way you want to do it. Sometimes the fish, um, if they're up kind of close to the boat or sometimes they're even kind of hiding under the boat, kind of watch, they're, like, they're like this, they're watching for the baits. And what they're doing is when a bait hits the water and swims down the way, they pounce on it quickly. So if you're noticing that people are, are putting their bait in the water and they're hooking up within 10, 15 seconds of their bait hitting the water, that's the preference that the fish are showing. Um, now I like to use, and I don't hook them back towards the tail so much. Um, sardines have, and I don't really have a sardine here, sorry. Right about here, they've got two little fins, two little fins in the in the middle of their chest, and there's a there's a bone right here, just like the wishbone on a, on a chicken or on a turkey, and they have the same bone right there. So right about here, I'm going to go crossways there, and then when I when, I don't even hardly have to cast it, I'll just kind of flip it out about ten feet from the boat, and as soon as that bait hits the water, when it's hooked like this. He dives down and he's swimming away as fast as he can. And when the fish are in that ambush mode, boom, you're going to get a, get a bite within a few seconds. Uh, the disadvantage is that the bait will die quite a bit quicker. He might live 10 or 15 minutes hooked like this. He'll live about three minutes hooked like this. And then as soon as you start to reel him in, 
the hook just tears out anyway. So um, I think that answered the question. Mm -hmm. Fly line, hook bait, or drop rig? Oh, okay, well, there's dropper loop, then that's more of a yellowtail thing. We're gonna talk about that later. Um, the sinker rig um, is also usually fished on something a little bit heavier than this. We're gonna to get to that too. So these first two rigs that we talked about, I would say for tuna, not albacore, but tuna, 95% of the time there's no sinker. Um, Sometimes with albacore, and again, you you older anglers out there, you remember what albacore are. Um, I used to love to use a large split shot, but until the albacore come back and I can see them, I'm not going by rumors. <laughs> I want to see the albacore. Then we'll talk about that. Did, did that answer it? What is a slip sinker? What is a slip sinker? And of course I didn't bring one. It's an it's a egg sliding. It's a, it's a sliding, sliding sinker. It's egg shaped with a hole in the middle. So you put your put it, your line through it and it slides up and down on the line. And that can be a half an ounce and it could be three or four ounces, just adapted to the uh, to the conditions at hand. What do you look for at the bait tank when you're grabbing a fresh one? Oh boy. We could do a whole hour on that, but we're not going to <laughs> but sometimes you'll hear me um, when, when we're out on the boat or, or at the Fred Hall show or what or whatnot bait selection bait selection bait selection and everything that we've been talking about is to maximize the presentation of the bait because a lot of people grew up freshwater fishing where freshwater fish bass and whatnot they're ambush predators they want a wounded bait, bait or a bleeding bait or a dying bait uh, that's how they feed Open ocean fish like tuna, they rely on speed. Um, I'm I'm almost convinced that they're that they're a little bit like the T Rex in Jurassic Park. They can barely even see the bait if it's not moving. So you're looking in the bait tank, and there's a hundred sardines swimming around and around in a circle like that. And you look at them, and and you're just a human. They all look the same to you. They do not all look the same to the fish. So you just kind of take a step back, and it's better to do this before the fish are actually biting. Sort of practice. Uh, check with one of the crew for um, um, some tips. But you're looking for uh, usually a, a sardine that's that's uh, a little, maybe a little bit lighter color. That usually means that it's a little bit healthier. Uh, it's not missing any scales. Sometimes, you know, when, when the bait boat catches the, the sardines, it's not an easy process. And they'll lose scales, so they'll have little missing scales or even a red mark where the scale is gone. Or they'll have a red nose from bumping into the side of the bait tank. Uh, or, or even if they've been uh, in the bait tank, if you're on a, on a five or six or seven day trip and, and the bait's just been in the bait tank for a long time, it'll be just like a, a, an aquarium fish. It'll start to get kind of some, uh, some uh, fungus growing on the, on the fins and whatnot. Those, those baits are not going to be very lively. And... Uh, and that's, you know, for fish like lingcod and sand bass and, and stuff like that, where they're down there on the bottom, they're an ambush predator too. But an open ocean predator like a tuna or a wahoo or something like that, he wants to chase something. He wants something to try to run away from him, and he's going to chase it down and eat it. So if you don't have a good, good, lively bait, you're not going to get a bite. Also, I'm right-handed. I'm going, to show, I'm going to show this. It takes a little bit, a little bit of practice. Learn to catch your bait with the with your left hand. So you've got the hook already in your right hand, ready to go. Learn to catch the bait with your left hand. Don't, even though you're mad at the bait, don't take your anger out on the bait. If you've got sardine scales in your hand, you squeeze it too hard. So learn to cup the bait like that gently, and then that way, with your right hand, you're ready to go. Pin, pin the hook into the bait and get it into the water. I like to I like have maybe a little count of maybe no more than 15 seconds and 10 is better between the time the bait leaves the water from the bait tank and ends up in the water outside the boat. Because what is, what is bait? It's just a fish. And when fish are out of water, they start to die. The least amount of time that you can take from the bait tank into the water is going to be better for you. Again, I hope that answered the question. Mm -hmm. 
All right, we're gonna keep moving. We're, we're moving up. All you that are out there, when's he gonna talk about big tuna? I'm gonna. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Yeah, I have two questions. Yeah, see, that. I told you. I told you that would happen. All right. Now. Whoa. Here we are. Now, if Santa Claus is only going to buy you one rod. Oh, what's coming up? Valentine's Day is coming up. If your Valentine is only going to buy you one rod. This is going to be the one that it should be. This is your 40 pound rig. This is the one that does the most number of different things, whether you're just going out on, a, on an overnight trip or a day and a half trip, staying fairly close to San Diego, or even if you're all the way down on, you know, with art on a, on a seven day trip down to Alijos Rocks or the Ridge or someplace like that. And everywhere in between, you're at the end of the year, you will have caught the most number of fish on your 40 pound rig. It's not always perfect, but you better have it where you know where it is. And this is, and, and just for giggles and grins, I broke out the pen torque 25 narrow. I know that, uh, that a lot of you prefer the price of the fathom and I don't blame you, but the torque is, is just a phenomenal, phenomenal series of reels. They come in the same sizes in the fathoms. Unfortunately, no lefties. Sorry, in the torque, no lefties. But that 25 narrow size um, is just hard to beat. I put about, on, the, on this one, I'll put about uh, 400 yards of 65-pound braid on this. And that's a lot of line. And then I'll put about a 25-yard top shot of 40-pound line of filament on top of that. I can catch tuna. In fact, way, way back, I think it was 2010, this reel wasn't even out. I had, I had the only model that existed on earth i had the field test model and i caught a 102 pound tuna on the searcher the very first 100 pound tuna ever caught on one of these reels was caught on the searcher i think kenny gaffed it too <laughs> so um it, this is just really a useful useful thing i like again i like about an eight foot rod most of the time if i'm going to use 40 pound test I'm going to use a rod that's rated something like uh, 25 to 50, 30 to 60, somewhere in there. I always want my, my line to be as close to the middle of the rod's line rating as possible. If you go to a shorter rod, like a seven-footer, it does give you a little more power. Um, sometimes I'll get, I'll get daring and I'll, and I'll use this with a nine-foot rod. That, that's a long rod. That, that takes a little bit more handling. But most of the time, I'm going to use this with, with, with an eight-footer. And a lot of times I'll use it with that's a number two owner Mutu hook. I don't know. If, I don't know if that'll even show up. Let's see. Does that does that help? Ooh, look at that. I, sh I should have thought of started that earlier. I'll use this with uh, uh, four feet of forty pound fluorocarbon, and I'll fish for 60, 70, 80, 90, up to hundred pound tuna. And there's a, there's a little story involved in that. I don't usually tell big one that got away stories, but we'll get to that. And uh, also, this is probably my favorite rig for using for live bait for Wahoo when, when you're on those longer seven-day and eight-day trips uh, in, in the fall when our kids down there where the Wahoo are. And sometimes Wahoo are like any other fish. They're not going to bite a lure. They only want to bite a live bait. You better make sure that you've got a rig that can handle them. Now, another thing that was super, super hot last year that the 40-pound rig is perfect for is what are called dart jigs. And I've got, I've got to, I'm going to try to show these to the camera. I don't know how successful I'm going to be. I'm going to try. And these are pretty small jigs. Uh, these particular ones happen to be my favorites, which are the, um, the uh, Williamson Gomame. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm hacking that pronunciation. And they come in a couple of different sizes. They come in like a, 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 a one and three quarter, a two and three quarter, and a three and a half ounce size. Um, and what this is imitating, again, how many times has Art been out there? And you got and you got huge schools of tuna, and they're eating bait this big. And if you try to make them eat a big old sardine or a big old mackerel, they're not going to do it. They are locked on to biting a small, a small bait, and that's all they're going to bite. So you have to give them what they want. Um, you can see that 
actually, well, that one's got some bite marks on it. That's probably my favorite size, mainly because it casts the easiest and sinks the deepest the fastest. And I always take these lures and I upgrade the hooks. Those are owner ST66 treble hooks. Again, I don't know if you can see that, but it's a lot thicker wire than these lures. Uh, the lures, these lures I think are, are, are made for smaller fish. So the hooks they come with are, are not that strong. I always do, do retrofit them to the heavier hooks. Um, and sometimes you'll be out there and it's literally 60 pound tuna biting that little tiny, what does that say? 1.2 ounce jig, because that's what they're eating. And again, I don't like to, I don't ordinarily like to tell big one that got away stories. I like to tell big one that I caught stories. But on that exact Williamson Gomame in the, in the, in the purple, which is, that's a really good color. I mean, that, that is a really good color. And this exact, the, the, everything the same, this reel, this rod, everything, <coughs> that color I hooked last, uh, what month was it? I think it was November, might've been October. I hooked a 200 pound tuna on this, right in the middle of a school of 30 pounders. I hooked a 200 pounder on it, and by sheer dumb luck, the fish swam the wrong way a couple of times. I got him after about an hour and a half, fairly near the boat, and then he didn't get landed. So that's just kind of the way it goes. Uh, but it, it proves that A, that quality tackle, all your knots are properly tied. Um, you've got a reel with the drag properly set, and it's a two-speed. You can catch, not that I recommend this for 200 pounders, but that means if, quotation marks, air quotes, a 100 pounder bites this when you were expecting a 30 pounder, you got a good fighting chance of landing. And uh, I mean, Art, you saw a variety of different conditions with these with these dart type jigs last year. Anything you want to add on on maybe color selection or a particular way to fish them that you saw that was really good? Yeah, we have a question about blue the best lures for bluefin tuna. Well, this is for under hundred pounds. Well, we haven't gotten to the big bluefin yet. I, I I hear you through the internet out there. This is for under hundred pounds, but. You know what? What's wrong with the 50-pound bluefin? I, I wasn't that long all ago day, where the 50-pound bluefin would have been the biggest one of the year. Absolutely. I think that you you've covered all the bases with those lures, Steve. I I don't think I have much to add. I think that you know the most of the bites are on the sink. I think, and so uh, it's not a skip jig situation. It's more of you know you're running up on. Uh, a boiling school of tuna and you're casting that towards that school of tuna and you know we're coming on the PA and saying that they're you know directly under the boat and they're down you know 150 feet and so you need to let that jig fall and sink to, to that depth and hopefully you get a bite on the, on the sink. And we have a question about retrofitting Steve are oh. you okay with split rings or do you weld? Oh, yes, I am okay with split rings as long as you use the owner split rings or some other brand that actually has the pound test written on the package. So, so you can go to, we won't mention any names, your large uh, general discount stores where you can buy a bag of, of uh, 20 split rings for a dollar. Don't get those. Um, I, I use the, the owners and... Uh, Generally, these are all uh, around 120 pound test split rings, quite a bit heavier than my than than my line could even possibly be. And then I, I, I go to the ST66 treble hook, which is a, a heavier wire treble hook. And whatever size treble the lure comes with from the factory, whatever that is, they're different. I go up one size. So uh, that I think is a 2.0 treble hook. This lure from the factory comes with a 1.0. Uh -huh. It's seven. Bigger hooks. Bigger, better. bigger hook. I have two questions. Why a treble hook over a single hook, and who makes that jig? Okay, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, that, that, uh, let's see if I can show this to the camera. I don't know if I can show this to the camera. This is a Williamson. Uh, that's way too small. The camera will not pick that up. Williamson, which is a, a which is a division of Rapala lures, not Rapala. It's Rapala. And um, uh, this is called the Gomame. I'm sure that means something. 
but I don't know what that means, but that's the name of it. And if you look that way, that's the secret right there. It's got a little bit of an S curve to it. And that has just been absolutely deadly, deadly. And so the question is, why treble hook and not a single hook? And sometimes I do use a single hook. As the fish get bigger, there's no doubt in my mind that the single hook holds them better. It just does. However, there's something about this style of jig, and I, I have experimented all over the place, and I will continue to experiment. For whatever reason, you get a lot more bites with the treble hook, whether it looks more natural, whether it has a different action that the fish like better, I, I can't really say. But um, I, and I always have a few of these with single hooks on them, because once the fish start to be over 100 pounds, treble hooks can be problematic. But um, I'd rather you know, get the hooks too small. And generally, you end yeah. up pulling the hook out. Yeah, I would. I would. I would. Or it straightens. Well, they're not going to straighten the SD66, but they okay. can still pull them out. But again, I would rather get four bites on that and maybe land two, than get only one bite on that and land it. That's kind of that's kind of the and, and they just on um, this style of jig, maybe not some other ones, but on this style of jig. Again, it's, I've proved it to myself, and other people have, have proved it to me with, with their success. You get more bites with the treble. Maybe someday somebody will explain why. That's To me, that's one of those why ask why type of deals. But I, I definitely fish them both ways, no doubt about it. Go with what works. Go Exactly. Go with what works. On any given day, the fish have the final vote, always. You guys are asking, you guys out there are asking great questions. I love it. And the manufacturer of the lures? Manufacturer, well, is it's well, the, the, that's just too small for the camera. <laughs> so, well, Williamson, Williamson is, is, is that is a division of Rapala lures. A lot of you think it's pronounced Rapala, but it's Rapala. And um, I mean, I'm sure they have a website that they sell them on. I'm sure that yeah, your local tackle shop can get them if they don't have. Oh, Lane Koto helps us with gomame. It's small dried sardines. Oh, there you have it. There you have it. How about that? You got. You know what? It's no one of us knows more than all of us. That's great. I'm going to be stealing it. Sorry. <laughs> small, small dry sardine. Okay. All right. So, gosh, this is great. How are we doing on time? Great. Next up. Doing good. Or? Okay. Yeah, okay. Up. All right. Uh, real quick, what rod did you have with that reel? Um, I have it on a eight foot rod that is rated twenty five to sixty. So again, that forty pound test is dead in the middle. Um, Can you compare what you were just describing to a Colt sniper? Yeah. It's <laughs> well, a Colt sniper is a dark blue. Yeah, that, that, that's one of, the, one of the other popular brands, but there's probably at least a dozen different brands. Um, I, I've settled on this one because, again, I like that. I like that S-curve. It's really been good for me. Some of them you can actually, you, you can manually bend them, too, I've, I've seen. Obviously, these don't do that, but there are ones that are made of maybe a little bit softer lead and that if it came straight, you can put your own little S in it and, right. and uh, duplicate that. Sure. Start owner hooks are sharp. <laughs> yeah, be careful. Okay, now now we're getting down to it. I know you those, those of you who are out there, you've been sitting patiently going, when's he gonna talk about two? Well, it looks like a yellowtail outfit to me. Well, the way I have it rigged it is. This is rig number four, this is your, and those of you that converse with me online, this is what I call the 50, 60, 80 pound rig. And I've got, this is a 10 fathom, 40 narrow, two speed. And I've got, this particular rod is only six and a half feet long, but the rod could be as long as eight feet. It's kind of depending on what you want. And uh, I've got 500 yards of 80 pound test braid on the reel. That leaves room for about a 25 to maybe 50 yard top shot of whatever the captain tells you you better be using that day. And sometimes he'll have a different opinion in the evening than he had in the morning. Um, but th this rig is very versatile. And again, it'll fish 50, it'll fish 60, it'll fish 80. Um, I've got it rigged up here with a yo-yo jig for yellowtail. Uh, you could also use it with 
you know, with the mid-size fall type jigs. Um, this, I kind of like to say for tuna, this covers tuna from roughly 75 to 175 pounds. Now, up until a few years ago, that would have been as big as you could ever conceive of catching mm -hmm. within 500 miles of San Diego. You just didn't need anything heavier than this. Um, and things have changed, so we're getting to, we're getting to that. But uh, this is also um, a very popular rig, and I definitely want Art to chime in on this. The, especially last year, late in the season, uh, that is 2020, late in the season, uh, the tuna wanted a live sardine on what's called a sinker rig. And, and again, I apologize, I didn't bring one. Art's done some good videos already of how to use a, a 4 to 12 ounce sinker and attach it to your line with a rubber band so you can you can look that that old video. We did that on the last uh, tackle yeah. talk live. Our mono did that. And um, so, but the tuna wanted that 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 bait way down deep. You know, anywhere from 120 to probably 300 feet down. And this was usually the rig that you used to present that to to those. That, that's a quality size fish, 75 to 175 pounds. And um, what were the conditions that you noticed where where that sinker rig was really the thing to use? Well, um, frequently it was, you know, at sunset or just after sunset and right before sunrise, the sinker rig seemed to be working pretty well. And um, nose hook bait and you're drifting on a school, you know, both late in the day or, or we saw a school, um, you know, driving around before daylight and... Um, those time periods seem to be the time that um, sinker rigs were working pretty well. And, um, it, you know, it's it's all about us finding a school that kind of sticks with us. You know, we drift along for an extended period of time with fish underneath the boat. And, and they're at the depth that you're talking about, 150 to 300 feet. And, yeah, the you know, the you might think, well, okay, we're going to try flat falls. And nobody's getting any bites on flat fall lures at that time. And so somebody drops down with a sinker rig and they're on. And so then everybody gets swung over to sinker rigs. And that's how you end up landing the majority of your fish. As I said, the fish always have the final boat. But this rig, this rig, and again, I've got this on a, on a six and a half foot rod. Could be as long as an eight footer. Generally, I'll look for something. Uh, if you're going to fish 50 and 60 and 80, that means like a rod that's rated 40 to 100. And um, uh, besides the tuna with the sinker rig, this is also good for larger size tuna. Fly lining, it's great as we have it rigged up here for yo-yo and for yellowtail. And for that matter, if you get on one of those longer trips, like a seven day trip, and you get down into the area where the wahoo are, this is the rig that you'll throw your wahoo bombs, your raider jigs, that kind of thing with. So this is, this is definitely a don't leave the dock without a type of rig. Certainly. And um, the, the other thing, like uh, we have those spring trips coming up in, in May and June and sometimes kelp had a yellowtail. So if you brought this one outfit, um, it, if there's 75 to 125 bluefin tuna biting, uh, this would be a multi-purpose outfit that would cover several bases. You could tie a yo-yo lure on if we are stopping on a kelp patty and and uh, go a little bit deeper um, for yellowtail. And then, you know, later in the day, if we run across a school of tuna, you could use it for, for a sinker rig or for fly line, whichever they're biting at the time. Yeah, this is definitely a don't leave the dock without a type of rig. And again, up until I think 2016, the biggest tuna you could ever expect to catch even somewhat locally to San Diego, you could catch with this. Certainly. Now, since then, things have changed. Oh, but we have a question coming in. What size floor or mono do you recommend on the live bait sinker rig? Well, again, 50, 60, 80 uh, depends on how big the fish are, the tuna, how well they're biting, and how big the bait is. So there's no there's no exact, you know, art, art will tell you, uh, oh, they're big, don't drop in anything less than 80. <laughs> And that's that's good, but but if you drop in 50 pound test when our told you to drop in 80, you'll regret it. <laughs> <laughs> and a reel for 
Kite fishing. Oh, we haven't gotten there yet. Okay. Jumping ahead. We haven't gotten. You're jumping ahead. That's okay. All right. And all right. Let me put this over here. I have a question. Do you change your treble hooks on irons as well? Um, on for for yo yo and for yellowtail, no. Most of the time, uh, you know, Taddy and Salas and some, you know, your your standard uh, lure companies have been making that type of yo yo iron for yellowtail for 50 years. They have it pretty well down to a, to a science, and, and in that kind of case, I don't I don't change it. Sometimes uh, when we're down on the on the longer trips and there's wahoo around, uh, I will change. I'll use a pair of uh, bolt cutters. I'll will cut the uh, I'll cut the treble hook off, and I'll put on an owner open eye sidewash hook for the wahoo. But most of the time, I'm catching wahoo these days on bombs or something else that already comes with that type of a hook. Every once in a while. I will still do it, but but if you're just going to yo-yo for yellowtail, in almost all cases, if you have a name brand iron jig, the hooks are fine. Do you have an opinion about color fluorocarbon? You know, I was just thinking about that. Um, uh, there's a lot of we, again. We could really go off into the weeds on that one. Uh, I just use clear. You know, I've used, I've tried a couple of different colors, you know, the smoke, the light blue. There's a certain cult out there that loves pink. They love the light pink fluorocarbon. Um, I can't actually say that I've noticed much of a difference. It's way more important that you have the right pound test. Just because it's invisible doesn't mean you can get away with using something too heavy. And once again, make sure that you're using the right size hook. What about colored braid? What about color braid? Well, I'm going to let Art chime in on that one because that's uh, you know the, the the dark greens and the and dark gray color braids can be hard to see for the crew. Art, what do you have to say about that? Well, yeah, green is like a nightmare as far <laughs> as braid is concerned because it's just it's very very hard to untangle, and that's one thing about you know the transition from fishing from straight mono into braid has uh, taught us some patience because of the tangles that we get with the braided line. So, you know, white is, is what we see the majority of. And um, we don't, from time to time, you see green or gray. But, um, you know, I think that white overall is the most popular and I think that as far as manufacturers are concerned, that you know they've really got it down now. So strength or um, you know diameter, that sort of thing. Um, you know, it's it's. I, I think it's a personal preference and confidence. It's like fluorocarbon. It's personal preference and what you use. And if you're getting bites on clear, then you're going to continue to go out and purchase clear. If you're if all you have is pink and you're getting bites on pink and you gain confidence in it, then the next time you go buy fluorocarbon, you're going to buy pink. Because yeah, you know, if you have confidence in something, yeah, or as as though, again, those of you that are out there, PFA, positive fish attitude. If you have confidence in your lure or your hook or whatever it is, yeah, or just yourself, you're going to fish harder. You're going to pay more attention. You're going to stay at the rail. Magically, you're going to catch more fish. Yeah, exactly. And it's not because of the color of the fluorocarbon. It's because you had confidence. Right. And as far as the color of the braid is concerned, I, um, I don't think that the color makes that much difference. I, like I said, you can get braid from the same manufacturer, and they have green or they have white. And if you chose to buy green, well, that's what you have. I can just tell you that from... From our standpoint, when it's green or gray, it's you're going to take a lot longer getting out of a tangle, and you're <laughs> going to end up probably losing quite a bit of your braid because it's just harder to untangle, and we end up cutting it. Yeah. Well, yeah. And so anytime the longer the fish stays in the water, the higher the percentage is that something will go wrong. True. You know, a shark will come along or, you know, that knot that you thought was perfect, maybe it wasn't so perfect. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so if it's taken the crewman twice as long to get you out of that tangle, 
something else may happen during that period. Absolutely. And if you're in a tangle, then you're not fishing. Uh, yeah. So. Okay. All right. I have one question before we move on. Okay. Uh, what is your go-to knot for mono to braid? Mono to braid. I I, I was going to get to that anyway, but <laughs> there we go. Um, I tie most of the time, or almost, I, I would say almost all the time now. Uh, the It's called the, uh, the RP knot or the John Collins knot. I'm sure Art's demonstrated it. Mm -hmm. You can you can look on YouTube and find a lot of people that tie it. Um, awesome. I, gen I generally use seven turns. Sometimes with a lighter line, like like the 20 pound test, I use eight turns. And then sort of my little trick, my little thing that's different than than what everybody does is, and you're gonna have to look at the video that shows how to do it. When you go through the final time with the tag end as you're about to finish the knot, you then come around and you come through twice. That's my little extra tip. And uh, yeah, that's what I use. And and going back to that story that I told a little earlier about the 200 pounder I, I fought and lost on my 40 pound rig, I had my, my, my knot was absolutely as stressed as any knot could ever be. And then, you were just it it it, it helped. You were overmatched. I was overmatched, and you know the the line, the line broke. Big fish. The line broke right at the fish, just because it finally wore out. It's just the way it works. Again, before you get started on that, hollow core versus solid braid recommendations. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, for Tom, I, 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 those of you that know me know that I, I tend to like to change. Like if I don't get a bite in about. 10 seconds, I'm changing, change this, change that, longer top shot, shorter top shot, different hook, different lure, whatever. So I almost always tie knots. Um, solid ties way better. Also, when you're fly lining, solid doesn't pick up as much water and slow the bait down. However, when you're dealing with really big fish and you're dealing with basically 130 pound line and up, such as on the kite rig, for whoever it was that asked about the kite rig, uh, splicing with the hollow is better. But for everything, 100 pound test and down, I prefer the, the, uh, the solid. Good question. I agree with that. It's easier to tie. And um, it's, you know, I mean, you want to be in the game. So if you're taking a long time to put a, a, a top shot in your hollow core, um, you're not, you're not out of the game. You're, you're not fishing. fishing. You're not fishing. You're tying a knot. So yeah, it doesn't matter when when you're on the way out, but it, but sure enough, you're going to have to re-rig in the middle of a bite when the fish when the fish are all around the boat. That's not the time to be wasting time. And, and then that's the time that you have multiple outfits that are rigged the same, and so you don't have to re-rig. You just go grab another outfit. But then then you're talking about bringing ten rods instead of five rods. Right. Right. So here we go. We saved this for last on purpose. Don't leave the dock without it. Before 2016, the California state record bluefin tuna was 240 pounds. And I think up to that point, there had only been maybe four or five tuna bluefin ever caught in California over 200 pounds, ever. Since 2016? 2016. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm talking about California waters. Got it. Um, since 2016, needless to say, it's gone up about 80 pounds a year. And it now stands at, I don't, I'm not sure if the people actually applied for the record, but I think it was in October or November of 2020, there was a 412 pounder, I believe it was caught, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in California waters. So they're out there. Um, so, uh, an outfit like this, and we're going to talk about some options, is don't leave the dock without it. I can't tell you how many people have emailed me and said, well, I'm looking for getting some gear. I'm not, I'm not looking to go after 200 pounders. And I say, you know, the minute you're on a day and a half trip out of San Diego, you're in the water with 200 pounders. And you, and you, can't, you can't pick and choose who, who decides to bite your rib. You better be ready to land that fish of a lifetime. Now, it's another whole it's another whole episode of uh, Facebook Live to discuss why those two are here and how long they're gonna be here, we don't know. So you better catch the biggest fish of your life while you can. 
the rod you just do not leave home without these days is your Penn International 16 VISX. I like to fill that one up. I get about 500 yards of 100 pound test braid on there. And then this one, I, occasionally I'll use this with live bait in a sinker rig, but about 90% of the time, I'm using a big fall type jig. Uh, in the nighttime, I'm gonna use one that's glow in the dark. In the daytime, I may use one that's partially glow in the dark or even just blue and chrome. And these are a couple different brands. Uh, that's a Nomad, that's a Taddy. And our friend Joey Shimizu might be out there listening. So I wanna make sure I show his lure. And then this is, again, from our friends at Williamson, aka Rapala, that is the Kensaki jig, which is actually just hitting the market this week. And I've got a couple of different ways to rig them up. Uh, sometimes I like to use a big single hook on the tail and two, hook, two of the big heavy uh, uh, assist hooks off the nose. Sometimes I like two heavy assist hooks off the tail. Um, Art, you have... Any particular uh, uh, opinion there? No, um, I think that, you know, we've stressed that you need to change the factory hooks, but it looks to me like these things are coming with the right ones, with the right um, the right setup there. But uh, I know that that's something that we've been doing in the past is changing hooks because the, the hook isn't sufficient or the the line going from the hook to the split ring is not sufficient. So, well, and I, I happen to know that that split ring there, it's two hundred and ten pound test. There you go. Okay, that, that's an, that's an owner split two hundred and ten pound test. I forgot exactly what number. Yeah, it and and you know we've been seeing that. You know, you might as well have you know one that's two hundred and fifty grams, or I think that's, that's three hundred. That's three twenty. Three hundred twenty grams. So heavier is better. Um, that way, if it's a little windy, the boat is drifting faster, and so you're going to get down to the bite zone with a little bit heavier lure than if you use a, a hundred gram. You know, you're you may get there, and then as the boat's drifting, you're, you're not going to stay in the bite zone very long. So heavier is better. And and you can see on all these, or maybe you can't see, uh, these have got about uh, three or four feet of at least 200 pound test and as heavy as 300 pound test. It can be monofilament, it can be fluorocarbon, doesn't really matter. No. Because obviously if it's 300 pound test, they don't care what it looks like. That's yeah. more, more of an abrasion, cheaper. abrasion against their teeth. That's that's what it's there for. And um, again, I've got um, a rod that's rated for um, 80 to 130 pound test. This is a seven footer. Um, I wouldn't use anything anything shorter than six and a half, and a few of the more daring, more athletic people will go as long as seven and a half on this. This is a rail rod, so it's got a nice, heavy, heavily padded foregrip, so you can lay that thing on the rail, put it up under your left armpit, and if you're if you're old and frail like me, it is truly a godsend. You push that easy button, you push, put it into low, and. Um, I can catch big fish better than now than when I was, you know, 25 years old. Absolutely. It's, it's yeah. truly amazing. And that 16 is the one you don't leave the dock without. I've gotten enough emails, especially last year as the fish got bigger and bigger and 200 pounders weren't even, weren't even exceptional anymore. A lot of boats are getting multiple 300 pounders on the same trip. And as we know, again, there was at least one 400 pounder caught. Now you're up to, the 20 size reel, that's a heavy reel. That's hard for me to fish with. Um, so what ends up happening, I have it all rigged up, but I'm not very motivated to use it. And so if I'm not using it, guess what happens? I won't catch a fish with it. This reel, it's considering the power that it has, um, it's light enough. I think it's uh, 43 ounces. And uh, I, caught, I caught a 313 pounder on it. Um, the reel did great, the, the old fisherman Holding the reel did not do that great, <laughs> but I landed it and didn't die. <laughs> and so, I, I, again, I have a lot of confidence in this size reel. For those of you that, that feel like you just want the next step up, the, the 20 International is a great reel. Uh, you can look up the specs online and decide uh, decide what you want to use. I see a question. Would it work for jig fishing flat falls? 
Well, yeah, that's what we're talking about. Um, uh, uh, probably 80 to 85 percent of the time, we're talking about the fall type jigs. Uh, there are situations where I will use this with a, with, with a live sardine, or if we're lucky, enough, rig. with a lot with a sinker rig with a, with a live sardine or live mackerel. Every once in a while, I remember a few bites on the searcher in the past where we were getting 100 pound tuna on three pound live squids. So all those kind of things, it would do all of those. But most of the time, especially with the bluefin tuna have been biting in, in, in California waters, not hundreds of miles into Mexico, you're talking about the jigs. Again, a full glow in the dark for, for, for the nighttime. And then for dusk, a lot of times I'll go with the, uh, you know, the, uh, the tiger stripes, if you will, zebra stripes. More, much more important than exactly what color it is, that you have a good heavy leader, minimum of 200 pound test, 300's better, and definitely make sure you've got super heavy hooks on there. What size top shot? What size top shot? Well, uh, in this case, it's on, on top of the 100 pound braid, the top shot, and it's not very long, Actually, this one's been cut back a few times. I start out with 20 feet of 130 pound test. After about uh, two trips, it's it's down to about eight feet. Can you fish the big bluefin with a fathom 40 with 100 pound braid? Big is a very relative term. Okay, again, before 2000, you can. I don't you, know, you, you know, you your can. success rate may not be as. Yeah, if you. As, I, that email a lot because people these you know an international is not an inexpensive reel. Fathom forty narrow is awesome for seventy five to one seventy five. If you hook one bigger than that, we land it maybe, but that's the fish of your lifetime. And then there's the, the fathom sixty two is an awesome yeah. reel. It's an awesome reel if if maybe your budget can't. Uh, swing uh, an international, the Fathom 60. We have several of those on board uh, for loaner tackle for big bluefin, and they work. They work. They yeah, work the, the, the Fathoms are just an amazing, amazing value. Um, you know, the engineering that went into those, it's the same engineering on these, but basically um, they're medium frame. These are heavy frame. We could get off on that tangent. And these are machine aluminum. The Fathoms are die cast aluminum. Other than that, they're they're pretty close. They're a great reel. Steve, we're getting questions about slow pitch jigging for tuna. Okay, um, I'm gonna put this. There's where's Callie? There she is. Before we started this, um, we recorded uh, just a short little tidbit on slow pitch jigging. So it's whenever Callie decides she wants to post it up on the search channel. Good answer. That's not my responsibility. Yep. <laughs> Day two, on tackle tip live. <laughs> Do you ever soak chunk baits, and when is a good time to do that over fly lining a live bait? Oh, yeah. Yeah, this, uh, I, I should have added, this is also a really good outfit. And when we go to Guadalupe, this is the rig that I use for chunk baits. Um, I, I haven't been on a lot of good chunk bait bites in California waters. Um, I'd like Art to weigh in on that one. Yeah, you know, it's not, it's not something that um, – you know, stands out as any one trip or or a year where that was something that, you know, that was a key to getting a bite. I think it's incidental. I know that, you know, we, at times, um, you know, we have steady chunks going over the side and there are people that try it from time to time, but I think that, you know, the focus is on artificial lures and live bait, and so we don't really focus on chunking that often. Um, but it, it certainly is something to try. I mean, you know, you're about change. If you're not going to bite, you're changing your lure, you're changing your, your size hook, you're changing how long your top shot is, you're changing your presentation, your bait. Well, I mean, um, who's to say that throwing a chunk on and trying it when you're drifting uh, isn't something that you – could try and just remember, chunks don't swim. So if it's if it feels like your chunk is swimming off, something ate it. You got to bite, put it in gear. Speaking of bait, can you um, describe what is meant by cured bait? Oh, cured that, that's bait. an art. Yeah. That's an art thing right there. 
Well, we're, we're really, really lucky. Um, you know, that's what San Diego sport fishing is all about is the live bait aspect that sets us apart from the rest of the world, really. And we're lucky to have Birmingham Bait Brothers that uh, catches the bait for us. Well, uh, cured bait is um, the bait boat comes in on a Monday morning and puts the bait into our live bait receivers. And the guys that work on the receivers, they put a date that that box got bait in it and what size it is. And then they color code that. And so if the searcher comes out on a seven day trip on that same Monday, um, we're not going to get that bait that was caught that day. We're going to get bait that was caught five or six or seven days ago. So it's curing. It gets put in the box on a Monday. And then when the searcher or any other boat that's going on a three day trip or longer, um, they come to the bait receivers. They're going to get bait that is the oldest that has been curing in a bait receiver for X amount of days. Now, it doesn't happen all the time, but I'm going to say 80% of the time we're getting bait that's cured out. Uh, and there is, you know, with our bait capacity and lots of boats have the same bait, bait capacity or greater than what we have, we have the ability to cure bait on the boat. So if we got the bait that was five days old and um, we used up part of it, we didn't use all of it, then we're going to take what's left over and we're going to segregate it and put it in one of our many tanks on the boat. And that is cured bait. And so we add, oh, sorry, we add to that constantly. So we always have this little nest egg of cured bait. So I guess it's it's kind of like wine, you know? I mean, wine ages in barrels or whiskey ages in barrels. It's kind of like that. It's it's along that concept. It's been aged and it lives better, swims better, works better. Now to answer that, what that one other question, because I didn't bring one, best kite reel. So this is a 16, this is a 20. Just visualize a 50 VISX. How much it's about the same amount bigger as these two are. So imagine the 50 VISX, and that's you know, in the San Diego fleet, that's definitely become the kind of standard kite reel filled with a 130-pound braid. So uh, again. We're talking about rigs that you don't leave home without. Um, again, specialty rigs like the slow pitch rig, the, the surface iron rig, the kite rig, which of course you'll, you'll pretty much be using the boats, et cetera. But the five that we just discussed, those you want to bring on your own. And again, it, it has happened time and time again. Whichever one you didn't bring is the one you wish you had. <laughs> Rod size with a pen 20 VSIX. Okay, I'm assuming that you're going to be using uh, with the 20 VISX 100 pound braid. You can use 130, it just doesn't hold as much. Um, I would still use, I like seven foot rods in this particular class. You could go as short as six and a half or as long as seven and a half. And so if you're going to be using 100 and 130 pound braid on it, then I would get a rod that's rated like 80 to 150 so that your line use is in the middle of the line rating of the rod. And that applies even if you're fishing for trout with two, with two pound test, you want a rod that's rated one to six. You always want, you don't want to fish the lower or the upper end of the line rating of the rod. It just, they, they don't perform as well. Um, can we hear a little bit more about the Penn Fathom 25 narrow? <laughs> Six one one gear ratio versus four eight one gear ratio. Okay, that's the star drag models. And again, back on Cali, back on Cali. We we recorded a little short before we started this, um, and uh, uh, that's more of a surface iron type of thing. There's two different speeds of the twenty five narrow star drag. There's a four point eight to one and a six to one. Um, if you're an old school. Um, surface iron angler, and you're throwing the older style, style jigs, like a 7X or a, or a candy bar that were designed, or a Taddy 45, 
that were designed to be used with the old school reels from 50 years ago, then that 4.8 to 1 speed was is what these jigs are made for. If you're using some of the newer jigs, then the 6 to 1 gear ratio um, is going to be more compatible with, the, with, with some of the newer designs that are, that are out there. Um, I can't really say which one's best because it depends on what jigs you like. And I've talked to anglers, very skilled anglers, and it really boils down to, well, I happen to know this guy always fishes with 7Xs. And that guy always fishes with DW1s. Well, this guy's gotten the 4.8 to 1. This guy's gotten the 6 to 1. And they're both as happy as can be. So there's there's no such thing as the exact answer. There's only the exact answer for you. Stay tuned to Instagram and Facebook, and you'll <laughs> see Steve's Tackle Tip Thursday. <laughs> exactly. Stay tuned. Um, also, can you just do a brief rundown or recap of the five reels in case people miss Okay. It? I'm going to go in reverse order because I'm already holding this one. <laughs> this is from the, from the heaviest to the lightest. This is the Pen 16 VISX. And you use that with 100 pound braid, top shots from 80 to 130. And that's for the big tuna. And I know we all wish we could catch a big tuna, but sometimes the big tuna don't want to be caught. Then the next one down is your pen, fathom, or torque, 40 narrow, two speed, with could be used with 50, 60, or 80 pound top shots for everything from yo yoing for yellowtail to wahoo bombs to sinker rigs for 150 pound tuna. That's a fun rig to, to fish with. Then your 40 pound rig, which in the days before giant tuna were commonplace, this was your workhorse rig. That's a 25 narrow two speed. And you can use this one with uh, jigs or fly lining for tuna up to a pounds. You can catch bigger ones if, you know, if everything goes your way, but if they're over hundred pounds, you should be maybe Looking back there, you're 40 narrow. Just to clarify, that would be a good reel for casting surface irons, poppers into foaming bluefin tuna. Well, yes. Um, if the, if the bluefin are foamers and they're and they're and they're starting to get big, you do want to cast with the with the two speed. For regular size tuna and yellowtail, the star drags cast bent. Uh, again, it's a trade off. And we're going downward here. Come on. What am I? Uh, I don't want to knock the picture of Bill down. <laughs> and your 30 pound rig, that's your pen fathom. Where'd my other one go? Well, anyway, it's around here somewhere. Oh, well, there it is. Okay, that's your pen fathom 15 with 30 pound chest top shot. And that's for tuna any size up to about 75 pounds when they're finicky and only want to bite on 30 pound test. And obviously, any smaller game fish, whether it be yellowtail, or Wahoo, Dorado, et cetera, et cetera, that we're using 30 pound chest with live bait. This is a real fun outfit. If Albacore ever come back, we use this one a lot. Art hates it when I use the word Albacore. Just hope to get eaten more than one day. Yeah, someday we'll get back to them. And then your finesse rig is your, now we're back to a star drag because it's all about castability. This is for 20 or 25 pound test. And that is for, could be for tuna up to about 40 pounds. And any time that, that you've got, you know, school size tuna uh, around the boat, maybe the bait is small and the fish are finicky, uh, it's not easy to land a 35 pound or 40 pound tuna on this rig. Um, 25 pounders are not too hard. Um, but if it's the only way you can get a bite, you got to do what you got to do. So those are the five. And kite rigs, surface iron rigs, trolling rigs. Uh, slow pitch rigs, pop rigs, all those are optional, and we've done little shorty videos on all those things. But these five, you want. How about using a flying fish with a backpack setup on a UC Viper with the Penn International 20? Uh, well, what? Okay, I know what he's talking about. Okay, you lost me there. A life jacket rig for those for those who that don't know what that is is a frozen flying fish. Well, he's thought out. Um, with toothpicks that hold hold the wings out so that they're they're um, rigid, and then they take a half of a pool noodle and cut it. And take a pool noodle, cut it in half so it's just like uh, like like a, a, a half of a pool noodle, and they put it over the over the flying fish's back so it's like a life jacket. So now he floats, 
and you don't have to use a kite, you don't have to use a balloon, you just put them out there on the slide and just let them drift in the current, and now you're fishing with a flying fish without having to use it under a kite. That would be a great rig. Uh, a 20 international, even if a 300 pounder, even if a 300 pounder bites. How can we even talk about a 300 pounder biting as being an almost expected thing? Don't expect anything. The ocean does not give things up easily. So this is a, this a, that sort of rig is great for private boats probably. Yeah, I've seen a few people using them on, on, on party boats. You can either drop them back on the slide, or if you're in a long drift, you can drop them up off the bow and, and soak them out. It definitely does work. Um, it's a little bit inconvenient. you got to plan ahead. And, um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm people, sorry. I'm just seeing 25 people wanting a, a life jacket rig. Well, well, yeah. Life jacket well all right, all right, let me get you totally so, off the hook. Let me, I'm letting you totally off the hook. You do not need to supply the flying fish or the life jacket rig or the international number 20. Okay. That's people on their, on their own to bring them along. Oh, boy. <laughs> I have one last question. Okay. Is Steve going to have a day and a half or a two-day trip on the search? Yeah. Well, we're, we're looking into that. We've got the three-day trip, which, if, if I'm not wrong, Celia, unfortunately, I think we're full. But um, full. Oh, okay. Then go to on Facebook, Penn Fishing University. Do not go to my personal Facebook page unless you went to Culver City High School. Um, Penn Fishing University, like, follow. Um, I will be putting up as the different trips are scheduled, um, including the Northern California trips. They will be listed there. Stay tuned. A couple questions about the 300 to 400 fathom low profiles. Oh, well, um, it's too far over there for me to reach, but um, let's see, there it is, that one, there we go. We did, a, we did, a, we did a, a teaser with that one earlier too. That is, that's the Fathom 400. The 300 I think is a little bit small to use on the searcher, it's more of a private boat thing. Um, but the, the, the 400 here, which will hold um, a, a 50 pound test prospect grade that'll hold 280 yards of 50, Catch a pretty big fish with that. They cast beautifully. They have a phenomenal drag system, um, and they're just and they're just fun to fish with. Um, I would say you could certainly catch a bigger tuna than 75 pounds, but on a practical basis, if they're much over 50 pounds, you might be wanting to look at you know a, a two-speed reel or something like that. But for yellowtail and certainly for all the other smaller fish like dorado stuff like that. They are a ton of fun, and um, yeah, I like them. So by all means, but but notice it wasn't part of the five. This is what you call optional. Not one of the five that are don't leave home without them. You guys are asking great questions. Did you get the giveaway? Oh, the giveaway. Well, okay. Now, if you weren't nice to Callie or Celia or Art or Art, you're not going to win this. Okay. Thank you from the Walking Encyclopedia of Fishing, Mr. Steve Carson. <laughs> and your videographers are running out of battery. Uh oh, okay. <laughs> well, there's more questions. There's more questions. Here's what I would suggest you do um, you can go to Penn Fishing University, and when I get home tonight, I'll, I'll log on there and I'll answer the ones that I can. You can also, when this goes up uh, on, on uh, YouTube, which will that be, I don't know, tomorrow or the next day. I'll also go over to that. I'll answer the questions there. Um, I also have a forum on Bloody Decks called The World of Pen. And um, I will, again, once this is up on, on YouTube, I'll post it there too. Lots of ways. Steve, that was awesome. That had to be one of the, our better uh, Tackle Talk Lives. Well, what can I say? You're you're awesome, and you are the encyclopedia of fishing, and uh, we're just lucky to be associated with you, and we're grateful that you come on the searcher and you help us out, and we look forward to continuing that relationship, and hopefully um, one of the two-and-a-half-day trips in the spring. We'll get vaccinated. Yeah, and vaccination. And that'll open the door for more trips with Steve Carson. They're watching this in July. It's all a memory. It's all <laughs> yeah. in their rearview mirror. That's it. <laughs>
Thank you, Steve. All right, Thank thanks Steve. a lot. Thanks, everybody. Wow, that was. That was. Hold on. <laughs> okay. That was off the oh charts, Carson. Steve, I we well, first of all.